Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the House Committee on Government Operations and Military Affairs. It's Wednesday, April 19th, and uh, we are starting this morning with testimony on S42, um, which is the divestment uh, bill. And uh, I want to welcome our treasurer, Michael Patek, here. So thanks for joining us this morning. Yeah, well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Pleasure to be here with you and uh, with the committee as well. I believe you had a walkthrough already of the bill and also a walkthrough from the Senate. So I think I was just going to plan to talk a little bit about uh, my perspective in terms of where we uh, landed on the Senate side. And um, on the Senate side, I agreed and supported the bill. And I still agree and support the concept at the end. There were um, some additions that um, that the VPEC, the Vermont Pension Investment Committee, uh, liked, would have liked to have included that were not included. Just as you know, legislative process can work quickly sometimes. And um, they are things that I believe the Senate would be in agreement with. I, you know, I can't confirm that, but and I think there are things that other stakeholders would be um, favorable or favorably inclined toward as well. But you should talk to them uh, to confirm that. So, um, you know, the bill originally uh, started out um, and we proposed an amendment that largely would have exempted uh, uh, indexed funds and private investments, so private equity and private credit. Um, that was something we were, that was a compromise we were working on for, you know, quite a bit of time over in the Senate side, if I can remember. That ended up being um, amended to the current version of the bill uh, that has a few additional exemptions and a few different language changes. But we really approached this issue from a standpoint of, you know, do no harm to the pension system and to the investment returns and to the costs of the system. Uh, you really want to um, make sure that the pensions are strong and healthy. We've done a lot of work to shore them up in the last few years, as I think everyone on the committee is aware of, aware of um, you know, the future in terms of uh, investment returns and what the prospects uh, for pension systems look like over the next decade. It's not totally sunny and clear. There's some uh, concern on the horizon. So obviously, you know, from the treasurer standpoint, we wanted to come to this issue with the do no harm perspective. So. Uh, the bill, you know, I think provide, provided a flexible framework around this issue of divestment. There are a few pieces I'll mention that could provide more uh, flexibility or more security for VPIC. Um, but it also includes a study that I think is really important. The study would look at the fossil fuel holdings within uh, the, the Vermont pension system. Uh, currently, we have certainly have estimates as to how much fossil fuel related uh, positions are within the pension funds, but there's no certainty around that. And I think that would be a very useful thing to know and to measure, uh, because obviously, if you're not measuring something, you're not really understanding if it's um, getting bigger, getting smaller, improving, not improving. Uh, so there is a study in here that that would relate to measuring those fossil fuel investments, which I think is a critical piece of the bill uh, and something that um, is really important. So. The other piece of it, I mentioned the exemptions. Um, the Senate included, uh, you know, like three or four different sort of fiduciary duty related exemptions. So the plan uh, would apply to direct holdings, uh, to um, indexed funds. Um, they would require divestment under this plan to be created by VPIC by certain dates. But then there are also exemptions to moving forward with the plan, a uh, fiduciary duty exemption that's sort of broad. Uh, there's a de minimis exemption, so even if you're executing on the plan, you can hold a small amount of, uh, of securities in the fossil fuel industry. Uh, the Senate added uh, an exemption that if it was going to impact the ADEC, that the plan would stop moving forward. So if there was increased costs to the system that the state of Vermont would have to pay or employees might have to pay, that that would be a reason to not move forward with the plan. And then there was an exemption around private equity, private credit, uh, private investments, basically. And the two pieces of language that, um, you know, were a little bit different than an, an agreement that we had reached on the Senate side related to that de minimis exemption and to the private investment piece as well. So we'd, we'd be happy to provide language that I think would be acceptable to everybody, but just generally um, what parties seem to agree to on the de minimis, the sort of 2% that you can maintain in your uh, pension funds uh, was that that would be ongoing that there wouldn't have to be a fiduciary duty like decision to determine whether you could maintain 2% in the fund or not. There was sort of an ongoing ability to have some de minimis amount. Uh, I think that was in recognition of a desire to continue to do engagement on BPIC's part. Um, it was an acknowledgement that it's hard to 
for a VPIC like pension or VPIC like investments, I should say, to unwind every single piece of fossil fuel holdings potentially, because many of them are in index funds and private credit that we don't have the ability to just go out and sell. Um, there are other people that are sort of putting those together and controlling them. We're participating in them. Um, and then also just a, a recognition that that would provide more flexibility uh, under the plan. So there's that piece. And then there's the private investment where, uh, if I remember correctly, private investment wanted to be included in this in the study and the ability to measure how much fossil fuel uh, is in the system but it would not necessarily be subject to the plan uh, until there was a study conducted. And I think that that was sort of what, um, I think that's sort of, there was some language, and again, we'll provide this to you, provide just a little bit more clarity uh, on that point. Um, right now, I believe there's a fiduciary duty um, decision that needs to be made to not move forward with this plan as it relates to private investments. And we pick it asked for some more affirmative language and, I believe the language would be more consistent with what we uh, had discussed and agreed to on the Senate side, just again, didn't make it in. And then there's another piece that um, has come up subsequent to the um, language in the Senate side, which really relates to uh, immunity, uh, no private right of action, sort of legal protections for BPIC and BPIC members or the commissioners of BPIC. Um, you know, I think it, I view it as uh, something that would be wise to do, um, just as a belt and suspenders approach, um, that uh, it would provide uh, assurances and support for individual members of the VPIC committee that they're not holding themselves out to liability, even if it's not legitimate liability, there's always opportunities for people to make allegations and to sue. Um, and providing immunity, no private right of action, that kind of legal protection and immunity um, while still ma making sure that they're executing on their fiduciary duty obligations, uh, I think would provide some some well-deserved and smart um, protection for individuals that serve on VPIC, at least give them peace of mind and um, assurances that, you know, they're not uh, going to run afoul of, uh, you know, some uh, someone that disagrees with the decision here. So uh, those were the main provisions that I would certainly um, recommend that the committee consider in more depth on this topic and think about including in the language uh, of the bill on, on this side of the house um, or the side of the state house, I should say. But I think those are really the points that I wanted to mention. Um, I also wanted to mention actually that, uh, you know, just on the Senate side, and, you know, again, I was mentioned how things had moved quickly and I don't know if every stakeholder had an opportunity to uh, express their viewpoint. Um, so just a, um, a, a suggestion, you know, there's three different uh, systems that are impacted here, the teachers, the state employees, and the municipal. Um, so the teachers and the state employees uh, do get, you know, direct um, state support in different amounts. Uh, the municipal system really is from municipal dollars, but Beamers did not um, get an opportunity to at least testify in person, I believe, on the Senate side. And we were just at a Beamers meeting for their for their uh, system yesterday. And I mentioned that to them that I would make that point here just to make sure they are able to have their voices heard on this. Hey, good morning, Representative. Um, on the divestment thing, I've always sort of made the uh, comparison of you're either sitting in the stands eating peanuts or you're out on the field playing. Uh, we have not shaken the earth with our uh, engagement of corporations and trying to move them to another place, but at least we're voices there that other funds and individuals have rallied around or rallied with, and there has been some modification of positions. So that's been a positive thing. Um, to, I'm just going to hit points as they flash through my head. Of what <laughs> um, so engagement, I, I think we should stay on the field, which means I don't think we should just automatically exit certain strategies because they're not popular. Uh, I think there's just no possible way of not seeing a serious increase in our 
funding necessary to maintain the plan as it stands. And I suspect that will roll out to the ADEC fairly significantly. So the question that comes up of where's the money gonna come from? I assume you're sitting here with your treasurer's hat on. Uh, so where's the money gonna come from? Um, and lastly, beamers would be impacted, I suppose, because we, we don't run a separate uh, investment portfolio just for that. Everybody's in the same deal. And both the indexing and the private equity, private credit, and stocks and bonds, all the other things are, are combined, basically. So they would take a hit also, I would assume. <laughs> hey, well, thank you very much. I, on the engagement piece, um, again, I, I think you want to hear from uh, from VPIC, but you know the language that would change um, that I mentioned the two percent de minimis to applying basically as a permanent de minimis amount. Um, I think that would address some of the concerns around engagement because you would be able to continue to hold a small amount for a whole host of reasons. But one of the reasons would end up being that you then have holdings that you could do engagement um, with. So again, I'd, I'd hear more from VPIC on that, but that part uh, I think would satisfy at least my concern on that front. You know, on the, where's the money gonna come from piece? Um, you know, I, like I mentioned, I, want, I came come to this from a do no harm, which is another way of saying from the treasurer's hat, I guess. And, you know, there are the exemptions that are in the bill. I don't see them as creating a situation where it would be a significant loss to the system. I think it's a slow and thoughtful approach. Um, even that one exemption I mentioned that was added on the Senate side that would um, expressly say, don't continue with the plan if it's gonna raise um, costs or uh, the amount of the ADEC, whether that's on the expense side or on the investment loss side. Um, so that I view as another belt and suspenders to you know, general fiduciary duty exemption that exists. Um, and then the exemption from private equity. Well, we were, we're kind of teetering on the go below 7% now, which if that happens, the only... Yeah, I mean, the, the assumed rate of return um, separate from this conversation is, you know, one of the main, uh, you know, points that you want to watch, one of the main areas of concern, I would say. Nothing had nothing to do with, uh, you know, Vermont or Vermont's pension, just what you expect to see from the markets over the next 10 years. I know at the most recent VPIC meeting, there was some optimistic information in that regard as to expectations to hit 7% over the next decade. So that was an improvement that the likelihood of hitting that number has gone up um, in the recent few months or maybe last year. But um, but that's still something that generally, you know, you want to keep a close eye on. And, uh, you know, the framework that exists here um, with these additional inclusions, I. Just, I would be hard pressed to see that these would drive these specific reasons would drive the investment rate of return, you know, anywhere different than what is going to happen naturally by um, the state of the markets. Oh, um, you also mentioned Beamers, and I think that's right. I mean, the funds are all pooled together. So we talked about that a little bit at our office yesterday that I think to, you know, like, for example, in, the, in, in New York City, they um, have different pension systems and they move forward with a divestment plan, but the divestment plan only included their municipal city employees, their um, teachers for the city, but did not include the firefighters or the police uh, pensions. So they didn't have a divestment approach to all of their pension systems. But, I've, you know, in New York, those are separate entities. And here it would be costly and complex to, you know, try to pull out the different funds um, and you would lose probably some opportunity to invest in certain funds because you don't have this, the same size and scope. So that would be a challenge to try to do that, I think. Mr. Trekker, um, one of the things that, that you mentioned was that in one of the versions that didn't make it into the Senate has passed that the exemption that applies to private equity investments was also applied to index funds. And one of the things I've been having trouble wrapping my head around is the, um, how, how we would 
the whole idea with an index fund, and maybe you can explain that to the uninitiated who didn't go through what we went through the last couple of years in GovOps uh, in its previous incarnation. But how would we? Um, I'm trying to think of how would we have a, a divestment strategy that would really work. I mean, are there index funds that just don't that are specifically uh, sort of fossil fuel free already that other people have as a standard? I mean, how how would we? divest from index funds without uh, sort of getting ourselves into into some trouble. That's, that's yeah. what I'm So there's two, I mean, there are two, and there are two, you know, I think everyone sort of agreed that the direct holdings were relatively limited and that was a much more straightforward, you know, um, type of uh, situation where you could go and sell them and it didn't, you know, it didn't cause a, a lot of, um, you know, cost. It didn't, you know, you could replace them with something else and, maybe you didn't lose too much from a diversity standpoint, but the index funds and the private investments were two of significant focus. The, the index funds, I think it comes down more to the expense, like how much is it going to cost? I think on the private investment side, it's more about, are you going to lose the ability to gain returns? So on the index fund, the reason I say it's more about expense is because there are index funds that are green, that are fossil free, that are, you know, there, you can go the other way too and get, I think they're like a sin index fund out there too. But, you know, there are, there are funds that, that, you know, structure their um, funds that way, but they tend to be more actively managed. So it requires more, um, you know, expertise and more active uh, review of which funds are in the index fund to ensure, you know, that for some reason, a company that was not considered fossil fuel now is, or whatever it might be, or merge with another company. Uh, so it's more actively managed. And as a result, the expense ratio is higher than maybe like a standard S&P 500 index fund where you're just saying, you know, somebody else is determining what's in the S&P 500 and we're matching our index fund relative to that series of businesses. So that has changed, that has that ratio, it, it still does exist. I mean, there is a difference in cost, but it has been getting smaller over time um, as uh, you know, managers can do this more efficiently and more effectively. The SEC this month is supposed to be releasing um, rules around public companies releasing their basically carbon footprint, their climate impact. And I hope the SEC does that. I think it's a smart, transparent policy move for investors. But if they do do that, it would be a lot easier for index funds and managers to be able to put together lower expense um, portfolios because they would have a standard that every publicly traded company had to disclose to, and you could easily determine, you know, who's above or who's below when you're setting up your fund. So, so they, they're that, on the, so there's an expense piece of it there, um, much more so than losing of the return on investment, but the expense difference has gotten smaller over time. And I think there is a prospect that it would continue to become more even with the traditional index fund. I don't know what that time period would be, but you know, if the SEC makes that kind of real change, it would certainly put wind, you know, wind in the sails. Um, and then there is, you go back to the de minimis amount. So, you know, depending on um, what that number is, you could still have an index fund that had a limited number of holdings that uh, could fall under that exemption. So you wouldn't have to get out of that position simply for the fact it had a limited number of holdings. Um, so that's another, you know, that's another, um, you know, consideration there. So I'm really stealing a question from Representative Cooper of Burlington that I didn't even <laughs> ask. And he asked it before, and that's, uh, is there an actual definition for fossil fuel There is not in the bill. Um, the bill, which is one of the, I didn't get into this, but I think one of the other things I thought the Senate bill did well is that it provided a lot of flexibility and responsibility to VPIC to come up with some of the definitions um, and, the, and the critical definitions like fossil fuel company and then to come up with the plan around the concept of divestment. So um, there isn't a definition in the bill. And uh, the thought was to have VPIC um, be thoughtful and study it and, and, and propose a definition. And then if I could just follow up to it, I know, you know following the conversation you're talking about is it the FCC's that's looking for the carbon footprint of, of companies? The SEC, yeah. Um, uh, any concern there about uh, us eventually even going further with that and looking at companies that you know have a high carbon footprint, right? You know, output and say that we don't want to, we don't want to touch them. I mean, 
I just I just have a concern that uh, you know it could open the doors for for a, for a lot more. Yeah, so I think your 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 concern is basically it would there'd be a company that would have a you know maybe it's like Amazon that is not a fossil fuel company but they have a tremendous transportation network and maybe they're contributing to you know much more CO two than than anticipated. So you know that that would be for the legislature to you know deal with in the future. But I think from an SEC standpoint, it's important for investors to know that kind of information, particularly if it's a company that on its face, you might not think of as having a significant environmental or carbon impact. So I guess my answer is, I think it's important that investors generally know that information. Whether it goes further, it would have to be something the legislature, I think, would have to act on, or VPIC would have to decide, or any fund manager would have to decide the risk here uh, in terms of, um, you know, the financial risk. I mean, in terms of how this company operates is too significant for us to continue to have holdings in it because we think this transition that is occurring and will continue to occur to a more sustainable green energy structure, you know, that this company cannot survive that transition or won't be able to survive it in the same form. So, so unless there's a legislative direction or unless there's sort of a risk management determination, um, you know, I think either of those things would have to happen for some for a pension fund to act on that information. And then, and then I can follow up, but you know, again, just following the stream of thought, um, is is there a specific or are there specific guidelines for companies to determine their carbon footprint, or can each company have their own consultants and figure yeah. out? No, it's a great question, and um, that's why the SEC is doing what they're doing is because uh, you know they, they haven't put out their final rule, so we don't really know what's in it yet. But the conversation related to there's sort of like three tiers, if I remember correctly. Um, this is really testing my memory from a year or two ago when we wrote a comment letter. But uh, it was basically which level of impact are they going to measure towards? So is it sort of these initial impacts? Is it sort of these indirect impacts? And that was a big conversation. So, like for example, if you're FedEx and or if you're, if you're a company that doesn't have your own planes or transportation network, do you include the cost of of transportation, the carbon impact, or where do you cut the line? So the SEC hasn't landed on that yet, but that's an active um, debate. But one of the things that they did include in a proposal, which I thought was really useful, was a requirement that the CFO and the CEO sign uh, this disclosure as part of their annual statement, which really elevates the degree to which they have to apply due diligence and uh, analysis to these kind of disclosures. Uh, because, you know, that's if that's false, I mean, that's sort of a, that's an SEC violation. That's a potential criminal violation. So it really elevates the bar. And they're trying to get at this greenwashing that can occur where a company says, look how wonderful we're being on their website. But it's really marketing materials that's designed by their marketing department and not the kind of disclosure that would go through the rigorous you know, um, due diligence of experts and lawyers and financial uh, advisors to go into an annual statement. So it's actually what they're trying to do is create a uniform system that would um, cut against what some people are seeing now as greenwashing by certain businesses. Um, again, again, so, I mean, I again just thinking this through. You know, there's companies out there that are purchasing. Uh, carbon sequestration credits to green up their portfolio in a sense. And I mean, uh, I would think that would play into it as well. I, I don't know. Well, you would certainly see that, right? Because you would, <clears throat> I, I hope you would see that in the rule. Again, you have, we have to wait for the final rule. But, you know, f so for example, if, you, if a company said we're net zero because they were doing that, and that's all they were saying on their website, now, based on the standard, you'd have to see what they're carbon output was, and then you would see separately, you know, what they're doing in terms of carbon, you know, in terms of buying credits or whatnot. So I think it provides, the reason I like it is because it provides more transparency around this issue for investors relative to public companies. And it's something that other parts of the country are doing as well, other parts of the world. I mean, yeah. So, sure, I guess I want to follow up on that to a level that I don't think we, we quite hit today as we're framing up our continued conversation about this bill, which is, you know, you came in initially saying you're supportive of moving in this direction. There's some language that you'd like to see that hasn't made it into the bill, which I think we should be working on. And I'm very interested to hear what um, other folks from VPIC have to say on some of those items that you brought up. But 
I just want to ask you generally, does your support stem from the fact that there is inherent risk, both from the regulatory things that are going to be happening over the next few years nationally and internationally around climate policy and decarbonization and the way our energy systems are changing, that that, is, that presents a risk to the systems that isn't always really baked into experience studies, actuarial rates of return, the way that we currently measure the forecasting for our things like our pension funds. I mean, is that really what we're trying to get at here is that there's a kind of a missing component of risk? Yeah, I think you can approach this issue from that risk perspective, which is sort of where I've always sat on, uh, you know, coming from DFR, you know, we did a study looking at our insurance marketplace and saying, you know, what's happening with our weather, what's happening with the climate in Vermont, and how is that going to change underwriting practices for our insurance companies going forward? So if they have more severe weather in the spring, more hail, more wind, and they're having a lot more claims in that regard, they should be adjusting for that risk factor. Same thing with their own investments. If they're in a life insurance company with 30 years out of potential liability, and they have significant investments, you know, that have the potential to be stranded over time because of how, um, you know, how the energy market's moving, how how the sort of transition to green energy is going, then they should be mindful of that and managing their portfolios to that. So I think they're, so that's the viewpoint that, you know, coming from a regulator, we address this issue with, which is the risk factor. And that's why I think the study is so important because we don't have a real strong measurement of that risk right now. We don't know what the number is. We don't know if it's 5%, 2%, 1%. And that's a good baseline to start from, to know what your exposure is and then understanding how much risk there really is to manage. Um, but that's again why I think it's a thoughtful approach <clears throat> is necessary, a thoughtful, slow approach is necessary because this transition is happening. It's happening over the next decade or two. We have to re be mindful of it and respond to it. Um, and uh, you could also approach this issue from you know more of an advocacy uh, standpoint and a value statement against certain companies. But um, you know that becomes really challenging as to where you draw the line uh, on companies. But when there are companies that significantly you know have a real possibility of not earning the same kind of profit that they've earned over the last two decades or three decades, that's something that you should have on your radar and be mindful of. And I think I agree with that. The study should be our first step, and maybe then everything will fall into place after that. It, it seems to me like we're dealing with a political discussion that could have financial ramifications uh, if we divest from any fossil fuel company. Somebody else is going to come in and buy the shares or whatever. The impact on the company itself will probably be negligible. Once again, it would be a symbol that we're proactive in engagement in some way, but would be in the stands. Um, and the financial end of this is eventually it's going to fall down to the plan and its members to somehow make up the deficit. And that's uh, effectively saying the taxpayers, which that's another whole discussion, I guess. Which is a lot to say because I actually support the idea of cleaning up the atmosphere. Uh, Representative Waters Evans, go ahead. Um, you and I just made the same face, but here's my question. <laughs> Um, how do we know that there's going to be a deficit? Well, I, I mean, I, I don't, I think it's unlikely just because of the different exemptions that are included and, and even just the, the concept in its, of itself. I mean, I think from a risk standpoint, the type of returns a company is getting today in the fossil fuel sector in the, you know, is going to be different than a decade from now in a considerable way. So um, that is how. So you have to create a you have to create a plan to manage that risk. Um, and VPIC has done. You know, I should. You know, this committee hasn't had the opportunity that we talked about on the Senate side of the work that VPIC has done in this regard. Um, you know, having a, a decarbonization policy and 
have an ESG policy and, you know, being actively engaged with these companies. So it's not to suggest that this not happening now. I'm just generally talking about, you know, how I think you have to approach it with this sort of prospect on risk. Um, and then separate from that, you know, there are these exemptions, you know, the, obviously there's the, the core one is the fiduciary duty exemption. So if you think you're not going to get the same kind of monumental returns for some reason by following through on this plan, and that's a reason to pause the plan, you know, this de minimis exemption in terms of being able to hold on to a small amount, uh, making sure that the private credit is sort of private equity and credit is sort of off to the side where the biggest opportunity for returns are. And then also this ADEC exemption too, like if it's going to drive up costs to stop the plan, uh, pause the plan as well. So, you know, I think there are, I think structurally, it's the right kind of risk to be managing. And then exemption wise, I think there are quite a number of opportunities to um, pause if it looks like there would be this kind of deficit. Yeah, I'm, I guess the, the reason maybe my face turned up a little <laughs> bit I, in trying to think about the, the way that Representative Huber described the risk, because my read of S42 is that it is designed to say we're moving in the direction of divestment. We have these exemptions that we know would have an impact, and there's sort of a, you know, there's going to be a big impact on the ADEC. The do no harm maybe needs to be strengthened here, but the idea is that it's baked into the bill, right? The idea that we don't have to move forward with that plan if it's going to cost the taxpayer in terms of an increased ADEC. And I, and I also just want to say that the, the idea behind this bill, if you support any divestment uh, is that you fundamentally understand that we haven't done a good job <laughs> over the decades of baking in the real social and environmental costs of our economy. We've just done a terrible job <laughs> at it. Um, and, you know, I, I just, you know, we knew about greenhouse gas emissions when I was a little kid. And here I am, you know, approaching 40 and at this committee and we're, you know, talking about like, the idea that we would continue to invest in people who are extracting things that are warming the planet is just out. You know, that, that's the place I sort of stay rooted in. And so the risk to the funds is also in staying invested in things that we know are going to get increasingly regulated as the world warms and governments decide to. So I just I have, I have trouble uh, characterization of this concept generally being that it's going to be a negative uh, financially for, uh, especially when we're looking at these you know, five, 10 plus year horizons, doing a study, understanding the impacts and trying to take this thoughtful approach. So I, I just, I don't, I don't want to leave anybody with the impression yeah. that we're trying to put the pension funds or retired teachers or retired state employees on the hook. I think that's, I mean, that's a very, I think a very good perspective to have. I mean, um, you know, the trans it's about managing that transition. If you do it too quickly, you could, you know, and, and, and there's also some specifics with Vermont too, right? Like there are these vehicles that we're investing in that we don't have control over how they are designed or how they look necessarily. So we have to take that into account in terms of being thoughtful with the transition. Um, and then to your point, like it's governments responding to global warming crisis. It's individuals changing their own behavior. It's organizations changing their own behavior. You know, motor, uh, you know, certain states saying they're not going to sell combustible engines after a certain point. Auto, man, auto manufacturers saying they're not going to make them after a certain point. Like it just, you know, over the next ten years, give or take five years, there's significant changes that are on the uh, agenda uh, in terms of, um, you know how we currently operate in our economy and we just have to be mindful of those. Any other questions for Treasurer Pichak? Thank you very much. Yeah, for sure. We'll be happy to provide the language we mentioned and uh, if there are any follow-up questions, please let us know. Great. Thank you very much. I'd like to invite Chair Blanca up. Um, thanks for joining us this morning. I'm, I'm sure you'll have a lot to respond to uh, from the treasurer's testimony and some of the questions we had for him. So uh, I'll just give you the floor and then we can ask you some questions too. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I know some of you around the table, but um, my name is Tom Blanca. I'm chair of VPIC. Um, I've been a member of VPIC since 2014. 
I was appointed by Governor Douglas at that point for the Beamer slot, reappointed by Governor Shumlin. I became chair in 2016 when I left my role as city councilor here in the city of Montpelier. Um, I'm very committed to pensions. You know, this isn't about, you know, this isn't about whether or not we want to own fossil fuel stocks. This is really about BPIC, BPIC's autonomy, uh, issues in regards to costs, in issues in regards to what impacts you do today could have on you know, future beneficiaries of the trust here in Vermont. It's currently about six, a little less than $6 billion. Uh, our VPIC members take this responsibility seriously. Fiduciary responsibility is our primary concern. And we do actively work uh, with climate action. Uh, Katie Green, I, I would strongly recommend you bring her in here for testimony. She testified at the Senate. Uh, She's a tireless advocate for environmental issues, and it's built into our uh, DNA at BPIC in regards to how we view investment managers, how we hire investment managers, how we fire investment managers. Um, we currently have about 45 investment managers that manage this, uh, the pool of funds. To understand the complexity that you're looking at, that entails about 75,000 positions. So if you compare that to your individual portfolio, we have about 75,000 positions. That's broken into the three different trusts, so about 25,000 positions per trust. That's further broken down into about 10,500 individual issues. So I, I just want this committee to understand the magnitude of what the legislature is asking BPIC to do. We need to come up with a plan to divest. And that's another issue, you know, divest is a tool. We view it as a tool. We view it more as a tool of last resort, not necessarily as first resort. And because of that, we, we feel that our advocacy work, as well as Katie's work working with climate action groups on, with BlackRock, our, our progress that we've made since 2017 uh, with our uh, divestment committee that was uh, uh, co-chaired by myself and uh, former Treasurer Pierce, We've met all the goals of that divestment uh, task force back in 2017, including seeding a $200 million low carbon index fund uh, with BlackRock, which we're looking to get other vendors. Uh, we have money invested in lower carbon index funds, and we're working towards that initiative. The key issue with us with Senate 42 are really five things, and I've included that in my testimony. You can see our memo with recommended actions, recommended changes that we would be comfortable with. We were supportive of the treasurer's uh, suggestion that uh, index funds be excluded, um, mainly because over the past five years, we've had two pillars of our investment philosophy. One has been lowering costs through indexing, and the second has been working with private equity to build up uh, uh, work with top tier managers in the private equity space to be able to meet our rate of return assumption, which is currently at 7%. Um, we're at the table there with a couple issues. We do get into top tier managers. Um, top tier managers will not change their, their contracts for a, a state like Vermont. They just won't. We do not have 200 employees like California or New York. So we cannot do certain things that other states do. We rely on top tier managers to really perform for us and to provide us the extra rate of return that will get us to the 7%. Um, Katie Green, and I strongly once again ask you to bring her in here. She's part of the Climate 100 group with BlackRock. That's a representation of about $66 trillion in assets here in the United States. And that's working towards not divestment, but net zero and working towards net zero initiatives, forcing companies to actually create net zero pledges and actually investing in a net zero initiative versus, versus divestment. Once we divest, we lose that ability to you, you work, Katie. We lose that ability to be part of that network. It's been said that the, divest, the de minimis exclusion will allow us to continue. Well, that's to be debated. The current language, as I read it, or as I came out of the Senate, didn't extend de minimis past 2030 and didn't extend it to 2040. Um, one of our key recommendations is to make sure that's clear, that the de minimis standard in the bill um, extends indefinitely, because we really don't have the ability to pick and choose individual stocks. And it, it's not a matter of can we sell the stock? We potentially could. The question is, how do we mandate our managers or how do we buy index funds that aren't overly prohibitively expensive? And so with that, I don't really want to read my presentation because I think you can read it. You can answer, ask me any questions on it. There's really five things that I think I want to leave you with that I think um, VPIC has concerns with and how we get to any type of revisions or amendments, we're open to that change. We do support 
the idea of exempting uh, index funds and exempting private equity as this first year step until we complete the study. That's how Middlebury does it. They've exempted completely index funds as well as private equity as a first step, and they have different stages that they look at. I think that would give VPIC a lot more confidence that we'd be able to meet your goals and objectives. Um, the first thing I really want to say is, well, what is the role that we should play here in Vermont in terms of climate action? And we feel divestment will actually lower Vermont's impact on climate action from what we're doing today. Um, if we divest, we will no longer be able to have Katie Green represent us with that $66 billion or $66 trillion worth of assets. She's done tremendous work, and I'd hate to see us lose that initiative. The second piece, and you'll see this in my testimony, is we have a fiduciary attorney that we hire. And um, this bill, he has indicated to us, and there's a letter from him uh, dated last week, that this bill will open VPIC and the state up to liability on both ends. You know, people who want to divest, people who don't want to divest. This bill, he feels, is tailor-made for a lawsuit. Um, and he gave an example, a lawsuit that happened in California, where commissioners in California were brought through the ringer for five years and it ended up in bankruptcies, uh, lawsuits, and significant, it's a significant disincentive to get volunteers to come work for VPIC. We already, already have a difficult time getting staff because of our compensation study, which we submitted earlier this year that shows that we pay our staff 10 percentile of their peer group in terms of managing money. We're working on that issue too. Um, but to also get volunteer staff to, to man these boards is a tremendous concern. This, I think, would be the tipping point. where We would lose good members on BP if you do not have a language in this bill that would protect um, from us from a fiduciary point of view. Basically says, if, you know, if, if we decide it's not in our fiduciary interest, we don't have to follow through or we do follow through, whatever, you know, whatever language you see fit. He suggested some language that I supplied here. I think that would be an essential that VPIC would need to see. The third issue I do want to bring up is costs. Inevitably, this is going to cost more. You know, since 2016, we've gone on a strategy to lower costs through indexing. We're paying two basis points. Now, uh, 100 basis points is 1%. So for every one basis point increase in costs internally, it costs us about $560,000. So let that, let that sink in. Since 2016, we've lowered our overall cost of the pension trust from 60, roughly 65 basis points down to about 43 basis points. That doesn't seem a lot, but when you, when you talk about lowering the cost of running this fund, back in 2016, it cost about 25 million to basically all in, you know, run this trust. We're paying less than that now, all in, than we were back in 2016. And we have twice as many assets. You really have to look at it that way. And we also have incorporated a professional staff with a, C, with a CIO that we brought in um, to help us manage these in, investment pools at, at a top-notch level. And you'll see last year, for example, it was a terrible year. We were down like 7 8%. We were in the top 50 of 1,000 pension funds in Pension Investment Magazine. You know, in the year before, we were up about 26%, which was in the top tier. So we're, we've been managing these ups and downs through our indexing strategy and our private equity, as well as advocating for uh, climate action in our portfolio. Costs are going to go up, both internally as well as potentially externally. And, and what I mean by that and externally is could be potential unintended consequences if, if we're forced to, to lower our assumed rate of return. Why would we do that? Well, the biggest issue is private equity. Private equity provides most of our return above that 7% rate of return. If we have to exclude those asset classes from the mix, just simple math would mean we will not be able to meet the 7% rate. And then we'd have to address that issue. In Act 75, a couple, uh, two years ago, we were given authority to set the assumed rate of return. We don't plan on reviewing it until next year, but this would be a serious consideration that we have to take. Um, at the bill as written, according to our CIO, Eric Henry, he's indicated that we will have to start winding down some of our commitments as soon as 2025. If we start winding down or unwinding our, our commitments to private equity as early as next year, even though it's a seven year, 10 year, 15 year time horizon, we just won't be able to meet those rate of return assumptions. And so we'll have to seriously consider whether or not we can maintain the 7% rate of return.
If we lower it to 6.5%, that's about $50 million in extra cost. It's about $750 million in extra cost between now and 2038, which is the end of the amortization period. I'm not trying to scare anyone with that. Those are just reality. You know, that, that's the reality of where we're at. If we, if we are excluded from certain asset classes or have increased costs internally, it's going to ultimately lower our rate of return on, on the plan. It also, it exposes us to more volatility. I know there was a question earlier in regards to what's next. And I think that's the clear point. If we have to exclude energy stocks, what's next? Trucking, transportation, is it, is it plastics? Is it, you know, what comes next? And, and how much further do you have to um, increase in terms of the, the, the expected uh, variability in the portfolio in terms of risk? And we measure both return and risk. So both sides of those equations could be potentially impacted. Um, our estimates are in a divested model would be increased variability by about half of 1%. It doesn't sound like a lot, but over 20 years, it could be quite significant. And so I, I, I you know, fiduciary, as a fiduciary, we're, we're charged with maximizing return and minimizing risk. So I think we have to look at both ends of the equation. And I think in both ends, this bill is subjecting us up to, to concern. And that's why we really advocate for the, the, the not necessarily a pause, but actually looking at this study first and then potentially including mandates. Um, the last piece or, or another piece, you know, how will VPIC reconcile, you know, the legislative intent that's written if the language of the study next year comes back that it's going to cost more and it's going to increase risk? How are you going to respond to that? The legislative, legislative intent is very clear that divestment is the only answer. Um, our concern is we think it's a tool. We think it is something we should use. We are using it. We have fired managers over it, but we don't think it's the ultimate tool. We think uh, working towards net zero is the tool. Working through engagement is the tool. Working through BlackRock is the tool. Um, we don't think divestment is the only answer. And that's why we think if you did a comprehensive study, we'd be able to get that answer for you. And the last piece I'll say, and it's, it's more about Act 75. I was instrumental in helping Right, Act 75. And this, I think this undermines the authority of Act 75 or the intent of Act 75 to some extent. Um, we were vested with investment decisions as well as um, investment processes for the state pension funds. We think we've done a really good job, at, both in advocating for change as well as um, uh, lowering costs, as well as um, looking towards the future of how we'll be able to meet the, the, uh, the return needs between now and 2038. I think when we start chipping away at that authority, I think it undermines the ability of VPIC to do its job. And I think that's a serious concern that VPIC has. Um, with that, I'll open up to any questions. I, I know we submitted a lot in there. I think I've thrown a lot out at you. Um, there's, um, I, I strongly recommend you bring in Eric Henry, who is our uh, chief investment officer who runs it on a day-to-day -day basis. We have three staff people here in the state of Vermont who work for us under VPIC. We're over on uh, Baldwin Street. Um, I think we've, we've done a tremendous amount of work since the 2017 divestment study that, that we did. We've met all of the goals and objectives that were outlined in that, and, and we're moving forward now in terms of net zero. So I'm happy to answer any questions or to address any concerns. And we've, we've listed certain uh, suggestions that list or we would add into the bill, um, as well as our fiduciary letter, which lists potential um, <laughs> Thank you for your time, and I uh, really appreciate any questions. So, Chair Wonka, uh, really appreciate uh, the detailed information and the really thoughtful suggestions about how we uh, might be able to improve on the work that the um, Senate bill has. I um, I think the most obvious pieces around index funds are, are, are interesting to me. The other piece that I wanted to ask you about specifically was if I read the Senate bill correctly, they have essentially carved out the private equity to protect that from. And, and so I'm trying to understand um, the comments you made about uh, having to do the wind down immediately. Well, they I have. Thought they, the Senate tried to address that. They have and they have it. You know, they've listed it as legislation intent. It, it, it's a legislative intent to include it as part of the de minimis standard. So if you look at it, if you look at the language, it was still included 
that we have to manage and maintain it and include it in our plan. Um, so it is included in there. The original version that the Senate had basically strictly excluded it. And our objective really was more to keep it out until we actually know the true impact. We don't really know the true impact of what we have in our portfolio for private equity. Um, Maine did a study about a year ago. They have about 7%. Overall of their portfolio is about 7%. They probably have more because they were doing private equity pre-2016, which had a lot more of it in pre-2016 private equity. I don't anticipate that we'd have that much, but to try to pin down a requirement on a de minimis standard with that as part of the definition, I think is, is difficult to manage. I think you have to more clearly exclude private equity um, in the language of the bill. Um, it's, it's a little vague. The, the original versions weren't as vague, I guess, is probably my answer. Why we would have to unwind potentially positions is because I don't think we would be able to get into the uh, quality or the top tier managers at this point because of the because of the nature of private equity. Private equity is really a blind trust. Um, you're going into you're hiring a manager. You're not hiring. A, you're hiring a manager in a manager style. You're not really hiring. A, you can't really put restrictions on that. And so private equity lasts 15 years or more in terms of our hold. You know, we may commit now, they may not draw the capital three years from now, they may not make money or give money back 10 years from now, and they may wind down the private equity 15 to 20 years from now, or they may be rolled over into a new, new entity. We don't have the luxury uh, for a couple of reasons. We don't have the legal power, but we don't have the luxury to basically dictate some top tier managers um, both because of our $10 million or $20 million commitment, will you change the terms of your contract? Um, they would rather say no, uh, take it or leave it, or B, they won't offer it to us for a variety of reasons. One reason that our, our uh, uh, chief investment officer said we probably would be excluded was because they wouldn't want the potential liability. And this gets to that uh, legal liability, fiduciary language in terms of the bill. Uh, private equity managers, even though it's not specifically listed, would be very hesitant to get into the middle of a uh, legal statute issue if, if, it, uh, if they could get ever dragged into the, the investment of these funds. If we were forced to actually liquidate funds, which we, we would do everything in our power not to, but if we had to liquidate funds, they could be upwards of 20, 30, 40 percent discounts to value, and that would be completely unacceptable. So. You, you can understand my concern on it. You may not agree that you may think there's protections in there that allow us to have that flexibility. Our belief at BPIC is that the protections aren't strong enough and it's still peppered through the bill in regards to what well, you will consider, you will add it as, as, the, uh, um, as the definition, you will include it in the de minimis standard after the, after the 2030 uh, date. In addition, the 2030 date it's a little vague in regards to whether or not the de minimis standard extends past that. And so I think clarity of the language in regards to the de minimis statute, as well as private equity, I think just needs to be strengthened. We didn't have the time at the Senate to, to express our concerns. The language came out that Tuesday. Uh, we had our VPIC meeting that Thursday. We had serious concerns. They passed it out Friday. We, we really didn't have a chance at the Senate side to really delve into some of this uh, qualifying language that I put into the uh, memo that I have here. And so hopefully that answers it. I mean, maybe more confusing. No, no, I mean, the, the memo is clear. I, 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 yeah. I read the memo and, and I understand the concerns and I'm weighing, uh, I'm weighing what you're bringing up really seriously and whether I personally want to support it digging in and working on the language or waiting to you know, or just doing the study. I mean, I think there's a bunch of different paths we could take. You know, I'll tell the committee right now and you that I um, I support the value of trying to get our public money out, <laughs> but I also was part of investing the independence into VPIC to manage this pension fund money, and I believe in what we did. Oh, you also have to understand how the transition is going to play out. So think, think forward the next five, 10 years. What companies are going to be able to afford infrastructure changes that are going to make that change happen in a reality. And unfortunately, it may be some of these companies that you don't want to talk about today, but may come up with some technology because they have the billions of dollars that are needed. And because we're supporting them in these initiatives for change through our climate action, 
Um, we can support the companies that are doing that. We can get out of the companies that don't. We can add, you know, this work with BlackRock to create the low carbon index fund, I think is a tremendous first step. You know, we haven't really gotten other states to sign on to it. It hasn't performed as well as our other index fund, but it has been a, 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 a step into that direction. Of how do we get the big players that have the trillions of dollars of assets to work with these bigger companies? Katie's, there is some slides in there in regards to some of her advocacy work. When we started in 2016, I think about 7% of these companies in the Climate Action 100 had commitments to net zero initiatives by 2030. I think there's about 91% of the companies now are up to net zero pledges in the companies that they invest in. And so that's what we're looking at. That's how we will invest our index funds. That will, that's how we will advocate for change. It's not about blanking, setting up a list that we'll never touch. It's about trying to manage those lists through our partnerships with BlackRock, with uh, our investment managers. Uh, so, so we both win. You know, we make money on the investment side as well as, as, well as do good um, through our investments and can feel comfortable with the investments that we own. Other sets are doing the opposite approach, that they'll get sued if they, if, if they don't invest in fossil fuel stocks. So te Texas is a perfect example. They're adding similar language to their bill for the same exact reason, but on the opposite side, um, they feel they're going to get sued for the other reason. California is thinking they're going to get sued because of, you know, or Vermont's position, um, I, I think it's a, there's some happy medium in there, but, it, we're, and VPIC's willing to work with the legislature to, to do this report. Um, we have some concerns about funding it in future years, or is this gonna be a report that the legislature requires every year as written in the statute? Um, we don't have the staff to do it every year, particularly if we're looking at 10,000 positions and we're trying to, and companies change and our managers change. And, and so there's a lot of moving parts that I think this committee really needs to understand on how we manage money, and how um, we can affect change best. And I think Katie Green is the best example of what the state of Vermont offers. Um, in terms, you're talking about pledges that the companies are making. Mm -hmm. um, can you share a little bit about how they're evaluating the um, results in their process? Uh, yeah, Katie would be a great way to, I had it in my in their slides they put together. Um, if you look at the, they're measuring it through their, their net zero global goals and uh, they're measuring it by, to reach net zero by 2050 emissions need to be reduced annually by about 1.4 gigatons of carbon dioxide. Um, at 2000, so they base it on this, uh, and it's based on the state of Vermont goal, which is 2020 passed the Global Warming Solutions Act by uh, reduced GHG emissions to 26% below 2005 levels by 2025, 40% below 1990 levels by 2030, and 80% levels below 2050 levels. That's the state of Vermont goal, and that's what we use as a benchmark in terms of our climate. I don't know if that answers it. More specific, Katie can get into that and she can help you with the, the specific goals of what they bring to the table. Yeah, that was going to be my next question was about the rigor of those net zero pledges and, and what accountability that really is and who are the party independent people. You know, in, in my business, there's been an enormous conversation about greenwashing and sort of, you know, how, how do we... Um, well, I think, I think how you do it is you become part of a group that represents $68 trillion in assets and you maintain your membership in that group. If we divest, we're no longer part of that group. Representative Cooper. I have in the back of my head that um, basically news recently that one of the largest uh, Royal Dutch Shell curlers of hole into the crust uh, branched off into significant solar research and production. Um, if this were in, in place, we would not be in that market. So we would probably end up we would. into it later. So the, the point is that corporations change all the time so they can survive. And coming in on the back end of a, a, a great discovery or process change is not the way that we should function. Well, one thing that Katie has told me is that companies now are linking these global initiatives to compensation. So they're trying to tie in compensation goals for executives to these global goals. And that's really, I think, where this group is really starting to see impact. Um, 
when it's tied to the compensation of the executives, you tend to see more, more action in that, in that realm. I know they've had, uh, and they usually pull, like if it, if it makes progress, they'll pull the vote. Um, I, know, I know they had some uh, real success with Hess um, in terms of uh, some of the fracking uh, release of uh, methane in, in the Bakken region. I know, I know she brought up an example of that in the Seneca Bob's um, testimony. Um, she can go into the specific details of how, uh, how we've seen success, how we're seeing more success, and how the power of being part of a group of that nature is really um, uh, impressive. Um, you know, BlackRock is the industry standard, and you're actually seeing states say you can't, you can't work with BlackRock because of that, um, which is kind of interesting. Um, but we are working with BlackRock, and we're very supportive of their initiatives in terms of ESG, as well as um, uh, our global decarbonization. We don't call it divestment, we call it more decarbonization for this very reason. We think the goal is more decarbonizing the portfolio, not necessarily just divesting, um, because companies change, um, situations change, uh, investment opportunities change that can actually move us a little bit forward faster. Any other questions for Cherry Lock at this point? You've given us an enormous amount to read. I've, I, <laughs> I apologize. I've read through uh, your memo, but not everything that you sent. So I'll be doing some of my homework on this uh, before we move any further. Uh, Representative Waters Evans. Thank you. I, can you, um, talk about any possible um, negative impacts, financial impacts since 2017 when you started, not the divestment, but started making those changes. Um, did any, did any of those sort of worries at that time about changing the strategy, did any of those come to fruition? Well, we didn't, you know, the, the strategy changes we took place in 2016, 2017 were more indexing strategies and adding private equity. Uh, the, the result of the 2017 study for divestment was set, said that it, divestment was going to be more expensive, yeah. uh, but it advocated for change and it advocated for the initiatives that we've implemented. It, it, it really wasn't a, div we didn't. Right. We I didn't guess my question is that. because of those changes you implemented, have there been any um, our low carbon, well, our low carbon index fund has not performed as well of late uh, in relation to our <laughs> overall indexing strategy, um, mainly because uh, energy stocks outperformed last year. Um, so there have been some negative implications, not material, and we're willing to take them to figure out if it's worth it for the portfolio long term to add more money to it. We seeded it with 200 million and we're evaluating over a longer, longer time frame to see if that's an impact. We did look at the portfolio, what would have happened to the portfolio over the past three year average and five year average if it were divested um, in the way that the original bill was worded. Um, and it would have been a loss of about 87 million annually over three years and a loss of about 53 million in performance over five years. That was looking at our actual index that we have versus what we would have had to go in in terms of a divested strategy. So we, you're not supposed to look at past, past performance isn't really an indication of future return, but we did look at a three and five year number. Um, and we wouldn't do it as drastically as that, but that's kind of what, that causes some of our concern. Our initial read on our portfolio with some of the recommended products that are available right now would have caused a significant drop in our return over the past three and five year periods. Um, that's speculative, and so I don't want to bank on that. Um, our goal at VPIC is never to do that, and obviously to maximize the return and minimize the risk. Um, but if we're forced to do certain things or forced to exclude certain asset categories, that's where the numbers can change. We did also do a study in regards to what would it cost if we had to index. Um, and it was an extra $700,000 a year to index. And this was looking at a specific subset of uh, fossil fuel stocks. So it didn't get to that definition yet, um, but it was about $700,000 more in expenses it would have cost us uh, to use the other uh, index fund. And that was verified through the main, main did a study of the same nature. And they, they found the same level of increased cost on indexing. It's about, uh, for us, it was worked out to be about 696,000 in extra indexing costs uh, would go forward if we had to do the different indexing strategy. So between now and 2038, by the amortization period, that's you know, $17 million or so, potentially. Now, index fees will come down and we can evaluate that every year, but that's why I said earlier that 
I believe there's invariably going to be extra costs, either in increased staff here at VPIC, increased management fees through consultants, or increased indexing fees, all three of which um, would point up. We don't know the extent of that. And I think that's the purpose of the study. How, how can we quantify this? And how can we quantify some of our um, ESG work um, better for the legislature so you can have better, more informed decisions um, before you set mandates uh, that list out to 2030 or 2040? Um, you know, that would be our preference. Um, why would the three year uh, loss be greater than the five year loss? Um, the three year loss would be greater mainly because. Um, Fossil fuel stocks did better last year. Um, okay. So if you had to divest of those positions in 2022, you would have done a lot worse. And so that's why the three-year number is smoothed out a little bit differently. Okay. Um, so the five-year would have been a little yeah, bit. Yeah. You had, you had different so. years where taking out the index uh, exposure to the energy sector wouldn't have been as, it was maybe you did a little bit better in one year, but it smoothed it out a little bit more over the five-year period. Okay. Thank you. There's been a bit of volatility in uh, Ukraine. Most most, uh, <laughs> most industries in the last uh, three three and five year periods. <laughs> so well, oil going to zero for yeah. right? yeah. yeah. well, so We don't have a pandemic in Ukraine yet, and then also. <laughs> and remember, we have three people doing this, and so we're trying to manage the money, hire managers, uh, and, and also now throw this on top of it. It makes it much more complicated. But you know, we're willing to work with the legislature and how you see fit. Thank you uh, for giving us very uh, clear things to think about. Um, if we're going to do doing more work this bill, uh, I will definitely be in touch. And yep, and I'd be happy to, if anyone has any individual questions, you feel free to reach out, you know, and uh, we'll, we'll be in touch. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Uh, so, the committee, um, we are going to take a break uh, and be back at 1045 to take. Uh, some more testimony from the department on, on the sheriff's bill. Um, I'm working with stakeholders on some language there that uh, I think is going to need some work. So we'll uh, see something either tomorrow or Friday. Um, but the agenda might be switching around a little bit over the next couple of days. Um, I also uh, got a request from. Secretary of State's office to come and respond to some of the uh, things we've heard around ranked choice voting and they have some ideas that I think may help us focus our work uh, and, uh, and resolve some of the concerns that we've heard. Um, so we'll be hearing from them on Friday. Uh, yeah, keep in touch with me if you, a couple of folks have reached out with uh, agenda thoughts for the next couple of weeks, but uh, the clock is ticking down, so please be in touch with me. There's something burning you want to make sure that we try to <laughs> take some testimony on and prepare for next year or get out the door. Uh, as, as we've got a bunch of different vehicles moving, and I, I know that um, there's there are people that uh, are looking at our agenda carefully, and I'm in conversation with many uh, stakeholders in and outside of the room to try to make sure we get done as much good work as we can and maybe leave a few things to chew on when we get back here next year. So um, please, please be in touch if there's any strong feelings on any of those fronts. Um, so we'll adjourn and go off live for now. And I want everybody to be back here at 1045 and we'll pick it up then. All right, everybody. Welcome back to the House Committee on Government Operations and Military Affairs. Um, we are in our second part this morning, um, returning to conversations about S-17 and act relating sheriff's reforms and uh, have a couple of our uh, team from the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. And so uh, I think you would both like to introduce yourselves and thank you for being here today. Okay. Good morning, uh, committee members. Nice to see you all. My name is Annie Noonan. I'm the Director of Labor Relations and Operations for the Vermont Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. And I'm Roy Tebow, an attorney currently working with the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. So. Uh, with that, uh, obviously, S-17 has gone through a lot of iterations, both on the Senate side, and now we're looking at Amendment uh, version 1.2 here on the House side. Uh, Which we, just so you know, that I circulated some language that is not something we're presenting. So okay. it's just, there are some ideas for consideration, but the committee doesn't have that. I'm not putting that on the table yet. <laughs> okay, thank you for the um, clarification. Uh, 
nevertheless, we're happy with the direction generally that S-17 is going in. Um, and there are really four principles that have gotten internal discussions in the department. It's looking at how can there be greater accountability within the sheriff's organizations? How can there be transparency in terms of contracting and finance? How can we ensure professionalism within sheriff's departments? And also, how can we do some things to modernize the statutes that govern and regulate them? Uh, so turning to a different language uh, that is out there, uh, we'll start with um, what our section two focusing on focused on duties and what happens when you have a transition with the sheriff's department. Uh, this is one of those areas where accountability is key, meaning, making sure that the property and resources are continue to be held by the sheriff's department and that cannot be squandered away, liquidated into bonuses or other things like that. The role of the assistant uh, county judges or the uh, side judges as they're colloquially called is important as a check. Uh, they have control over the treasury for county government and here um, we are supportive of a plan that entails the side judges continuing to have an active role in maintaining the plan for disposition of any property when you have a lame duck sheriff and also uh, uh, making sure that that plan when completed is then turned over to the auditor of accounts for its reconciliation with the finances of the department in the long term and likewise that the assistant judges maintain a record of that as well. We believe that that ensures a greater degree of transparency and also will have sheriffs during that lame duck period uh, maintain um, a modicum of accountability and also ensure that they continue to act in the public's best interest and in the best interest of the long-term success of that department. I'll pause there if there are any questions on. So one question that has come up, uh, so we're talking about the, the period when a sheriff has said, I'm not running for re-election or, uh, and so there's this, the S-17 contemplates that there be um, additional potential for audit in that time and also the sort of need for two signatures of sign off. Um, and um, one of the conversations that we've had is about the, the filing of a plan uh, for, you know, if there are assets that are being sold, uh, where you mentioned a, a few of those examples. So the question I have is, is the side judge the best, the assistant judge the best uh, positioned sort of independent official that's at that level? Um, or should we consider that that sign off could come potentially from like the sheriff's executive committee or some other entity that isn't directly involved, but might have more insight into what's an appropriate expenditure or a sale or something that might be happening versus I just, I don't know how much in some communities the side judges will really have an insight and be able to sign off on some of those decisions. So that was a question that, that's come up. Well, I think that's a, cre a key issue, which is do the assistant judges actually know that they have you know that power? And I think what confuses the issue is that sheriffs really have three distinct funding streams. They have a state funding stream, a county funding stream, and then their own contracts. So that really makes regulating the entirety of sheriff's department difficult. So the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs right now is limited really to supervision over state transport deputies and you know, very limited uh, level of support uh, to the Sheriff's Departments. Likewise, uh, one of the reasons this bill has come about is because concern that the third uh, prong of funding, uh, that being the contract funding, is really just left to one statutory section and then discretion of the individual Sheriff's Departments about how they regulate, manage, and pursue those contracts and then use those funds. Um, I think the argument for the assistant judges to maintain that role, um, there may be an education requirement for them to be familiar with what they need to be looking for or concerned with, but ultimately they are also elected leaders who are selected by the populace of that particular county and control at least some county funds and county money that is distributed. So they already have a fiduciary relationship to the county. They are elected popularly by the citizens of that county. And it seems that they are best situated to understand and assess what's going on with law enforcement in that county and also uh, what um, the mood of the public is about how operations are going there. So in a situation where there is no one single player in state government or county government to do that, they seem to be maybe the best, um, best fit for lack of a clear choice. I think one of the things that would be helpful, though, is the side judges would probably need some training in terms of what are the bills that have to be paid 
um, an outgoing sheriff, um, still, we wouldn't want to be in a situation where things were being sold off and uh, to the extent that payroll can't be made and, you know, benefits stop because they didn't pay premiums on health insurance. So there would either need to be some really clear uh, directions to the side judges or these are the things you need to make sure are, are happening. Um, or it could even be the side judges in consultation with the sheriff's executive committee. Um, I think about a time that down in Wyndham where um, the other sheriffs uh, came to the financial assistance, financial aid of the Wyndham County Sheriff of Wyndham. So they had obviously a vested interest in making sure, and part of the reason they did that is they were making sure that the department was able to do things like make payroll. So I guess I'd throw those two points in. That I, one, I don't necessarily know that all the side judges recognize what their role is right now today, as we saw in Orange County, where they said, well, we didn't know that we didn't know that we should be watching what was being sold off. Number two, they would definitely need some review and training and maybe even short guidepost guidelines as to how what they what they need to be looking for. And then maybe they should consult with the sheriff executive committee if it's not clear. Some of the sheriffs going out are are just basically handing over the <clears throat> checkbook and there won't be any issues. But if there are issues, the side judges may or may not know and they may need some guidance. I, I like the language that you use around in consultation with because if it's the side judges in their you know elected role and they're down at the county level that are signing off, but they've got a clear legislative guidance that they should consult with the sheriffs who aren't in that county but are you know the experienced people that the sheriffs have elected to the executive committee that might be a way to sort of square the circle um, and I'd be interested in uh, hearing the sheriff's position on that but we, we should definitely uh, I'm, I'm thinking that that might be the best way to pull in the right voices if there is any I think that assures some subject matter expertise then yeah. about what would be normal to wind down during the end of a sheriff's tenure versus what would be something out of the ordinary. Uh, with that, we move on to uh, discussion of audits under Section 290B. There are a few areas uh, that we thought there could be some further enhancement or clarification. One is um, in subpart nine, which concerns procedures about notifying the auditor of accounts and department. Uh, about participation in non-public organizations. And uh, there's been at least one, uh, I think, fairly well-known example of a, of a sheriff participating in an external organization that was really supplementing the efforts or trying to collect its own uh, source of revenue to bolster uh, sheriff department operations. Uh, right now, that's the language uh, that we've seen in draft form talks about where the, um, an employee or an employee of the sheriff's department or the sheriff him or herself is a director in an organization. We think that should be broader to include participation, um, knowing that there can be sometimes a compulsive or uh, coercive effect, even if just a sheriff is sitting as part of some um, ostensible nonprofit or other organization trying to funnel money to that department. So uh, that's a fairly minor change, but we think that a broader view um, is appropriate for the limited uh, scope of cases. And additionally, in the in subparts, We'd actually like to have an addition to subpart E of uh, 24 VSA 290 um, E, 290B, then parenthetical E, sorry, it's a little confusing. Uh, we thought that it would be appropriate to expressly provide that an appropriation shall be made to the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs in support of the annual department audits. Um, it's one of those, it, it's a technical thing, but it's, I think, important to make sure that there's not an unfunded mandate to do this, given that there may be more audit activity than uh, historically there. Um, so even if just signaling by uh, this committee or appropriations, uh, um, as it may be, we think it's important to ensure that that's sustainable in the long term and that this isn't um, a priority right now uh, while there's a lot of attention on the Sheriff's Department. We currently have a line item in our budget to support audits, which are the, the which are the audits that occur to the sheriffs every other year. So we actually have an audit line in our budget. We estimated that if uh, I, the sheriffs have expressed concern about um, being subjected to uh, costs that they don't, they don't have. So we thought about what would it cost to put money, enough money in the budget to cover those so that if the auditor of accounts said, I don't like what I'm hearing over in this county, I want to take a look, um, we might, might be able just to support that with additional money to the to the audit line in our budget. I think I estimated with our, our financial person, Barb Bernardini, about $120,000 additional. Representative Maruki has a question. 
this is something that has come up as we've been talking about the whole concept of audits. Those different levels of audit. Are we talking about a full audit? Just an audit report? So what happens is that every other year there's a full audit okay. for the sheriff, and the next year it's basically a mini audit, I want to say. Cool. I don't know how what, how how um, Auditor Hoffer calls it, but it's a mini it's Sheriff Anderson might be able to answer what they call it, but we call it sort of like a very minimal minimal audit. Put your books in, we'll take a peek at them. Um, what's the current line item? So one hundred and forty thousand dollars. I think would be a big increase in, in that. If I'm remembering right. Right. I have to check on that, but I'm going. I'm going to say I think we have about. I think we have about eighty, sixty, or eighty thousand. But I would. I'll check and get back to you. I'll send an email. Okay. And that was the extent of our uh, comments or recommendations with respect to Section 3 at this time. Uh, Section 4 concerning uh, conflicts of interest or the appearance of conflicts of interest is an area uh, also ready for discussion. Uh, the House and Senate GovOps committees uh, within the past few years have promulgated and put into effect the state code of ethics and the apparatus for that. One of the things that um, was concerning from the Senate passed version of S-17 was creation of almost a parallel organization or some parallel standards that would only really apply to sheriffs and a substantial burden on the Department of State's strengths and sheriffs to then regulate how, how that worked. Um, this was an area where we felt that there's already an existing system that covers many other state officers and employees and that um, adaptation of the state code of ethics for application to sheriffs was more appropriate than creating a, a standalone um, basis. We also believe, uh, to get a little bit ahead, that the adherence to that policy provides clarity and consistency and also um, might lead to some reconsideration of changes made to uh, the use of the 5% funds given um, the adoption, potential adoption or requirement and statute for, for use of model and policies along with then more robust auditing and then of course the applicability and consequences of being subject to the state code of ethics. So our proposal uh, really focuses on integrating the state code of ethics and applying it to sheriffs and then limiting the department's role uh, to being a recipient and more or less have responsibility to vet and then forward those on to the state ethics uh, commission if appropriate. Um, some of those complaints, of course, could logically be sent back to a sheriff's department if it's a complaint, let's say, about a deputy sheriff, where the sheriff may be able to internally uh, deal with that through, through discipline. But the circumstances where it's the sheriff, him or herself, that may you know, then require forwarding on for a formal investigation. But we believe that that's a robust and strong organization that could handle uh, that type of work. And again, uh, it makes sense that as constitutional officers, sheriffs be subject to the same standards as the Secretary of State or the Attorney General or the Lieutenant Governor and so on. Is it, is it possible that, and this might be more of a question for you know, Deputy Director Simon, or excuse me, Director Simons or um, Chair Sorrell, but if we went with the, my concern, and this came up in testimony last week about just going to the state code of ethics is that that enforcement and accountability piece um, is a little bit vague. Like we haven't really seen in its current construct the ethics commission be able to do much more than make uh, some recommendations. Oftentimes, it's really useful and just making um, and having just the exposure is enough to create some accountability for. Uh, certain practices that I think the public would have concern about. But in the case of some of the behaviors we've seen from a couple sheriffs over the years, um, I wonder if just going to the, the state code of ethics, if there was a serious enough violation, if that in and of itself could trigger a referral for decertification with the criminal justice council. I guess that's what I'm thinking is, do you think that, that if, we, if we go to a construct where Instead of this conflict of interest policy that's in the Senate has passed, we're really looking at just bringing the sheriffs under the state code of ethics. Um, if there are really serious ethical complaints, you know, would those just go back to the department? Um, because if, it, if it's the sheriff themselves, it's one thing if it's a deputy, as you described, Roy, but if it's the sheriff, it's the leader, the constitutionally elected officer there. Um, 
what's you know they, what, what's the sort of next layer of accountability if it's a really serious complaint? Right. So I think two things are important. Of course, it's both the decertification proceedings or potential decertification proceedings through the Criminal Justice Council, and also the state ethics proceedings don't preclude pursuit of criminal prosecution by an appropriate you know, entity or investigation by an outside organization. And you know, this is pretty clear in all the sheriff misconduct. I think the committee's aware of. It's typically been the Boston police that come in to investigate, and then either combination of local or complex state's attorney taking on that role, or sometimes the AG's office being involved. What I will note is that in going back to section one, uh, category B misconduct uh, through the training council purview already includes misuse of official position for personal or economic gain. So that covers a broad range of the type of financial irregularities or ethical concerns that could trigger a uh, proceeding from the training council. And then the proposed additions of subpart H and I include gross negligence or willful misconduct in the performance of duties. I think that my interpretation would be that could include financial irregularities or um, other um, mismanagement of a department. Likewise, abuse of the powers granted through law enforcement certification under section 2358 of this title could also apply to some circumstances where there's unethical behavior or misuse of an official position for some sort of private or, or um, personal gain. Okay, uh, so one of the things that we ran into, I'm asking the committee to go way back. I've been talking to legislative council to try to find a way through this. But one of the things I keep coming back to is that what I would really like to, to have us see in the future is the ability when there's a serious criminal charge for there to be a pause, a suspension in the sheriff's authority and have somebody step in and pending the outcome. And I, I've asked, you know, legislative council and I've put Mr. Devlin uh, through several rounds of trying to work with, you know, our team here to figure out a way that doesn't violate the Constitution for us to have that layer of accountability. And, and, and I'm, I'm wondering if, you know, if we have a, an incident where we have a sheriff who, for instance, is charged with embezzlement. This is something that we've, you know, the kind of case that we've had in the past. So it's not just like a medical. Um, there isn't, shorter than being imprisoned under current statute, there isn't really a, a way to, to suspend their ability to move money around or continue to affect, you know, the benefits or the duties of their deputies. So, I mean, my, I feel like I keep running up against, I'm in this little box where we're talking about things like side judges signing off on stuff and what we're really faced with with some of these cases is a much bigger challenge. Um, yeah. So a few things, I, I, I think certainly um, we're aware of the constitutional concerns about the limits of the legislature to regulate a constitutional officer such as a sheriff. But that being said, of course, the longstanding principle is no person can or should be above the law. And I'll give some examples. So I was the, uh, for, so I was done with that term, I was the prosecutor and uh, former Sheriff Peter Newton's case. And we had substantial concerns from uh, law enforcement and uh, prosecutorial side about the ability to use that office to uh, potentially interfere with the rights of the victim in that case, to persuade or you know interfere with other witnesses, for example. And that really comes from the power that's vested in a sheriff as a principal law enforcement officer in a county. We also have concerns about possession and use and access to firearms. In that case, we sought and obtained from the court uh, conditions of release, which did several things. One precluded um, handling of firearms uh, by Sheriff Newton. And I'll just clarify, of course, all this is public record and in a public hearing, and there's court documents that substantiate this. So I'm not uh, disclosing anything that'd be out of turn. We also had argument about to what extent could the court inhibit or limit the law enforcement duties of the sheriff. And where we reached was um, language that precluded the exercise of direct law enforcement duties. So that would be going out on patrol. That would be carrying a service weapon as part of duties. It left uh, really the administrative functions of the sheriff intact. So things like approving payroll or dealing with hiring or you know, other uh, things that don't require a law enforcement certification. So if you kind of look at those two things, that there are things that a sheriff does that are principally law enforcement activities that require certification from, from the Vermont Criminal Justice Council versus those things that, um, you know, any person could do without having such certification. Um, so that was the order of the court that 
uh, precluded him from carrying a firearm and from exercising law enforcement uh, duties during that time period. If that time period was conditions of release, so there have been an arraignment, but not yet a conviction? Correct. So he was uh, arraigned. Uh, the probable cause has been found for uh, multiple offenses. And then uh, the case went on and has, as of yet, not resolved in his pending trial. And the flip of that would be if you had somebody who had been charged with embezzlement, you wouldn't want them doing administrative duties. You wouldn't want them handling a checkbook, uh, approving timesheets, doing anything with relationship to money. And of course, embezzlement, you know, in that situation, perhaps you could have said, you know, um, it, he's being charged criminally. So there's a criminal charge pending. But administratively, judge, we don't think that this person should have any ability to oversee administrative um, uh, responsibilities either, even in the terms of hiring, because the person's proven themselves at that point, or potentially, uh, potentially, um, that, they're, they're, that there's um, inappropriate decision making going on in terms of the functioning of the office. Interestingly, um, we talked about conditions of release. So I know this is not judiciary where everyone hears about them all the time. But uh, 13 DSA 7554 lays out two different criteria or two different sections that a court considers when fashioning conditions. One deals with risk of flight. The second part is about ensuring public safety. And that's really where a lot more of the, the debate takes place. Right now, there's a provision. It's subpart A to E. And this is um, limited, as Andy just mentioned, to embezzlement. Right now, our statutes allow for a court to impose a condition that allows for the suspension of an officer's duties in whole or in part if the defendant is a state, county, or municipal officer charged with violation, violating section 2537 of Title 13, and the court finds it necessary to protect the public. So that statute is a particular uh, embezzlement of public funds. One of our proposals is to broaden that, uh, given the precedent set here, to clarify that uh, the court, when dealing with any law enforcement officer, who has committed eight or has been found, probable cause has been found to have committed a crime, not exclude, not limiting it to just embezzlement. And the court finds that doing so, uh, that is a suspension of their duties, is that it's in the interest of justice. So there are a lot of, obviously there's a huge discussion about law enforcement um, accountability and misconduct and public, you know, public trust is not necessarily always the same as public safety. So there are maybe policy questions or considerations that uh, the legislature could consider about granting the court authority with appropriate findings to suspend those law enforcement portion of duties, which from our perspective is distinct from removing someone from office and is not tantamount to impeachment. Okay, um, so Boy, I just want to make it really clear that the department position is that, you know, if a court finds probable cause that they should be able to suspend the duties of a sheriff temporarily until the, the issue is resolved or the I guess, or until the sheriff would be, you know, impeached or exonerated. I think if considerations were not on the table, that would be completely logical. And looking at the other things a court can do. So if, let's say, a sheriff is uh, accused of committing a um, aggravated assault with a deadly weapon on somebody, they, they shoot a neighbor. Um, if that person were not a sheriff, uh, we'd be looking at the standard, you know, panoply of things. Should that person be held without bail because of the danger that they, you know, pose to the public? Are they a flight risk? You know, should there be bail involved because of uh, their potential to leave the state? And then other conditions. You know, if you have a firearm-related incident, um, probably 99% of times courts are going to issue an order saying this person should not have a firearm pending uh, the adjudication of the case. There can be other things, too, that are restricted or could preclude somebody from exercising their duties. A 24-hour curfew, for example. Uh, courts can issue a curfew and not allow people to leave uh, for any exceptions, although frequently there's legal, medical, or work exceptions that get worked in. But the court has very broad power in setting one's probable cause for a charge been found to tailor conditions that satisfy public safety. And, you know, applying that back to law enforcement defendants or a sheriff 
they do have heightened authority and responsibility because of the power to arrest, the power to you know carry weapons, the power to enter you know homes under exigent circumstances where we as regular you know citizens could not. So balancing you know the public safety analysis can be somewhat different when you're dealing with a law enforcement defendant versus someone else. And I, just to add, I think that um, Senator White, when she testified, noted that you know, accountability is one of the things people are really hungry for when looking at you know, the reform of the sheriff's profession. And I believe it was in her testimony that she pointed out um, that already 24 BSA Section 294 addresses circumstances where a sheriff is imprisoned. And, um, Again, none of us are, are constitutional scholars, and we'll defer to those who are, but the legislature has had on the books for years now um, effectively finding a circumstance where the sheriff can be suspended when he or she is incapacitated or can't discharge duties. That would be when they're in jail. You know, are there other circumstances where someone can't discharge um, you know, their, their duties because of a court order condition or infirmity? Or what do you do if a sheriff is arrested and held out of state and is physically not present or able to discharge their, their duties. There's any number of, of circumstances that um, seem illuminated by that existing statutory authority. When, if this committee considers further any questions of suspension, there, from a logical standpoint, there should be something between doing nothing and then the, you know, the ultimate option of impeachment. Um, noting, of course, too, that impeachment can sometimes run into hurdles of um, a prosecutor, let's say, not wanting to extend immunity, which would preclude that person from being able to present a defense to uh, the House or a trial before the Senate. Um, but suspension is a different concept than a removal from office, especially if that remains a compensated position or there's some you know, limited duties that are remain under um, such suspension. The temporary nature of it, making things contingent upon whether um, the House does or does not initiate impeachment proceedings and maybe putting a clock on that time period so there's some period to react and respond. Uh, but what I think is untenable is to have uh, sworn law enforcement officers uh, who are not really accountable to anyone other than voters um, discharging duties while they're facing very serious charges. And that's not a conceptual issue. It's one that we're dealing with even to this day in the state. So we've heard pretty loud and clear from legislative counsel that the suspension, the even a temporary one, gets us into pretty uh, murky territory constitutionally. And I share uh, the, the assertion you just made is something that I've said in some version, <laughs> probably several times on the record here, that it's um, pretty pretty extreme that even when there's been a crime committed, there's not uh, there's not any interim recourse then until the matter is completely settled. Whether it's you know criminal impeachment, um, that we don't have a whole lot of power, and even the decertification and, and that process um, leaves all of the administrative duties of the sheriff intact. The question I Another question that I have, and this might not be one for you, it might be another one for the Criminal Justice Council, is if the existence of a pending criminal uh, trial, so if, a, if there has been probable cause and there's been an arraignment of a sheriff, even the that that in some ways would preclude the Criminal Justice Council from doing their own investigation and decertifying. Um, as I understand it today, I mean, there, there's a hesitation for them to, to do anything parallel. So then you end up with a situation where because somebody has been charged with a crime but hasn't yet been convicted, that we're actually delaying the, the decertification potentially. I think that hesitation is the key word there. Um, and, you know, it does come down to questions of whether the prosecutorial agency wants to extend you know, immunity or can create a circumstance where they, I mean, one thing for sure is that the um, 
criminal justice counsel proceedings are held confidentially. Um, you know, I think the main goal is to not taint a prosecution, likewise not taint that process. So if a sheriff comes in and provides a defense, making sure that the information there does not leak back and taint the prosecution or impact the, the defendant sheriff's rights in, in criminal court. So that's a complexity and that's, I think, drives hesitation, but it's not an absolute bar on, on proceeding and there are ways um, you have to deal with that. Garrity. Yeah, we should be a Garrity warning. You know, Garrity writes to someone that basically says any information we, an employer, so an employer is doing an investigation where there may be criminal implications, says, can Garrity up, the, that, that, that term sort of Garrity up the person, so that any information that they take in uh, can't be used, can't be turned over to a criminal um, prosecution. Um, the, the, that, has, that information has to be found independently of what the employer found. So there is already, uh, that's a U.S. Supreme Court ruling. One other friction point with the constitutionality analysis is that the Constitution is fairly sparse in defining what sheriffs do and what their roles are, whereas the duties of the sheriff are really a, a construct of statutory law. So already this bill, S-17, is looking to amend Section 290. Uh, so one alternate path the committee could explore is, you know, having contingencies based upon what a sheriff's duties are, based upon either their level of law enforcement certification or other um, other qualifying um, circumstances. And again, I, I prefer and the constitutional law experts may disagree, but I want to uh, empower the committee with any idea to try to expand that. And again, it doesn't make sense that so much is left to the legislature to define in terms of scope of duties, yet not have the ability to then restrict or identify circumstances where there could be um, a limitation on duties. Okay, um, we'll have more questions for legislative council on this, I am sure, <laughs> but I appreciate uh, the department's position on it because it's, it's one that I, <laughs> since we started these conversations months ago, I've been wrestling with um, and this committee has been wrestling with. So, um, did you have further testimony on other sections? Of yes, the and I can be brief uh, given uh, the time. So moving on to uh, section five, you know, a fairly complicated one uh, in terms of dealing with you know, a lot. Uh, the big question here of really what are we doing with uh, sheriffs and contracts and what degree of accountability is necessary? I think that Chair Anderson uh, already testified before the committee about what, you know, I think everyone's probably exhausted of hearing what 5% is and what it can be you know, used for. Um, but the question re remains is, are, if, if other, and the department's considered this, if there are other safeguards, such as those that are contemplated or have been discussed about the adoption of model policies, about expanding the staffing and the oversight of the Department of State's attorneys and sheriffs, about being subject to you know, the state ethics uh, code, for example, and then having model policies, particularly dealing with compensation and benefits. Uh, is there as pressing of a need to actually you know, reform, reform that? And looking at it this way, it's changing how that can be used may substantially be mitigated or addressed by including those safeguards that deal with transparency and accountability and have real consequence for um, ability of other outside entities to react and detect malfeasance if it's occurring. Um, so that's a, a big policy question for the committee to consider. Um, certainly, our understanding is that the sheriffs are generally the view that that is the preferred option versus changing um, the ability to use the 5% uh, of what they uh, administrative overhead of from the contracts as they are able to do now. The just some other things as well, of course, is that um, when considering, you know, who can be involved in the development of model policies right now, the Criminal Justice Training Council does not generally have um, policies or deal with the regulation of finances in law enforcement departments because they're generally looking and this would be on the you know, conflict of interest policy as well, but they're generally looking at municipal or state entities where the executive, whether it's a chief or the colonel in the, in the case of the state police, don't have direct control over the budget and rather are you know, having that program from a legislative uh, body and are not in the business of going out and generating uh, their own funds. So we're not sure that the council is currently situated to really be um, the correct place to generate um, those policies. 
The other point as well is, you know, the term model policy is out there. And the question is, um, a lot of, and Sheriff Anderson probably speak to this better, but obviously operations in Essex County are fundamentally different than they are in Wyndham County. And one size fits all may not always be best. And there's some concern within the sheriff's departments and, and membership that making a model policy compulsory can have some significant drawbacks, but having guardrails for which they can, I guess, base their own policies on may be appropriate. That comes, of course, at the expense of then having potential for a little less consistency from what the legislature may desire. We don't have a direct proposal on that, but we do want to note that um, making sure that there's clarity in terms of what is a model policy versus those that should be compulsory or are going to be required would be helpful for the department and the sheriffs in terms of navigating reform. The really final point I will um, make is there's been some discussion about um, modifying or cleaning up some of the language around who is a state employee within the sheriff's department. Presently, it's the state transport deputies. There's also the contemplation in the bill uh, at SMT has passed to include uh, you know, mandates concerning court security, also uh, looking at the requirement to assist uh, victims of domestic violence or individuals who receive an RFA um, have their property managed. So two points on that. Um, the unfunded mandate portion of the assistance to individual plaintiffs in the RFA is, is problematic, and we'd be looking for some language to clarify an appropriation to um, either the department or some other entity that the sheriffs could seek reimbursement for, for those services that are rendered. And in terms of transport deputies, uh, section 290B and 296 both deal with this. And uh, this is a broader conversation about what proceedings should the state transport deputies be used for? And one thing we would like to see come out is clarity that those state transport deputies should only be utilized in cases where the state of Vermont is a party to the proceeding. So that covers our criminal, that covers criminal court proceedings, youthful offender proceedings, uh, chins proceedings where a juvenile is in, you know, in some sort of custody that needs transport, and then also um, mental health proceedings that are initiated by um, the state of Vermont through the commissioner of mental health. Um, beyond that, there are other circumstances where people may be transferred uh, to court that's historically or traditionally been done by the Department of Corrections. I think due to some of their staffing and policy concerns are less frequently able to do that, meaning some courts have tried to look and pigeonhole or compelled um, the state transport deputy program for you know, issues where the state of Vermont is not a party. So that could be civil proceedings or other things. And our department's concerned that as the courts are working through backlog and courts are fully open, the level and volume of transports for core functions, such as criminal court, has really gone back up and returned to, you know, close to or getting closer to pre-pandemic levels. Um, so allowing or clarifying that if the judiciary wishes to have um, someone who's incarcerated at a civil or not or hearing where the state's not a proceeding, that they could contract with the sheriffs and they could provide transport outside the scope of the state transport contract or contract with the Department of Corrections. Um, that's getting into the technical end of things, but we think that's important to make sure that that scarce resource of transport is used in the most prudent way to support the, the court cases. Um, is that particular issue addressed in a hall? And that's something you know, that's passed. I mean, I know we kind of touched on transport deputies, but I, the, the clarification when used, um, that was. I don't recall if it was if it came out of this the Senate bill as it came across. But we've been talking about this. This sort of just recently um, has been dumped, uh, attempted to be dumped on the department, and, and our transport deputies are dealing, as Rory said, with moving people. Um, for the, their criminal proceedings or their, their chins proceedings, whatever that is. And an example that Rory gave, which I think is really instructive, is you know, if somebody in, in a facility, you know, somebody's um, uh, incarcerated and they were in a car accident you know, two years ago and they're suing all state insurance company, why would, and they have to get to court, they've decided why would a state transport deputy have to manage getting that person to court for that proceeding it has nothing to do. The state of Vermont is not a, is not a, a party to that. These are state employees being paid by taxpayer funds. Why? And we don't have the capacity. 
we truly do not have the capacity to manage this. And when this first came out, I, I you know, I, the conversation about, oh, you're going to start doing this. You know, and I contacted DOC and I said, we have no capacity to do this. We have nothing in our budget to do this. We didn't anticipate any of this work. This has always been on DOC. And we just, it's, it's just not really a state, it's not, the state of Vermont is not a party to this. These are state employees doing work for the state of Vermont and not for private, private uh, lawsuits. And just for context, it, I don't believe this is in the original or the Senate passed version of S-17, but it was an important consideration when we started talking about the oversight and administration of the sheriffs and what, you know, what resources internal in the department are needed, what things could change, and then also you know, how do you account for and audit those expenses. And that was a concern of non-traditional transports coming into that funding stream of what that means you know, in the future. Um, the final, uh, final point to make is really looking at the um, proposal for um, an oversight task force and report. Um, ultimately, because of some of the things that are on the table to be considered, the need or the scope of any you know, report or callback could change, uh, particularly if there is a mandate for the adoption of model policies already in statute, if there's applicability of the state code of ethics, some of the questions that are being presented are going to be um, resolved by the legislature and not really um, needing further analysis. Ultimately, uh, in consultation with um, the sheriffs, our department's of the belief that if there is a report, our preference would be that it be the Department of State's attorney and sheriffs being tasked to provide a report to the legislature at, a, at some point in time, and that uh, the legislature identified parties or entities of, with whom the department is required to consult. And certainly the list of you know, agencies like DHR, um, the Sheriff's Association, DMH, um, the State Auditor, the Criminal Justice Council, all things, and of course the county assistant judges who we've been talking about today, all make uh, sense for further changes. But um, the consensus was that that was something that could be undertaken internally specifically because many of the remaining questions would result or really be geared towards the adoption of policies and resourcing for the department, not the overall statutory authority that are applicable to sheriffs. And I think there's two points. One, I may have mentioned this to the committee once before, but the auditor, state auditor's uh, manual in terms of fiscal uh, oversight and how, to, how, how the sheriffs conduct all of their fiscal work is really, um, it's done. I mean, it's been in play for years. It's an excellent, excellent um, uh, policy and model. And most of the sheriffs are following that. Their bookkeepers and their administrative staff are, are trained in it by the, the state auditor's office does, does um, did some Zoom calls over the uh, course of the past few years. It's really, I could feel like in, that there are areas that, um, particularly there was a question around 5% where we need, talked about making sure it's really clear what it should or should not be used for. That's fine. And I think the auditor would agree with that. But in terms of sort of day-to-day -day fiscal operations, it's a great policy. I think that the Criminal Justice Training Council has a lot of work that they're doing and have done around training law enforcement officers. I feel like you know, that would be a big section of what this uh, uh, proposed committee would be doing. And again, I feel like that's kind of reinventing the wheel. We have really excellent uh, guidance from the Criminal Justice Training Council about training law enforcement officers. Um, and I think that those areas here, whether, whether it's ethical considerations or it's um, around the 5%, I feel like those are the kinds of things that the department could be doing. And, and I come back to the term in consultation with all these other groups, but spending, um, you know, having this this large committee to talk about a bunch of things that are in other already being reviewed by the auditor or the criminal justice training council or by courts or by this legislature um, is is a, uh, probably not necessary. Um. It sounded like from what the, the Senate's conversation was about this, was that they're and just reading the plain text of the section about the oversight task force that, that they created. There's a real desire to look at sort of what do sheriffs do? 
What do we really want sheriffs to do? How should they be organized? What should the oversight be in a much broader context than just the development of model policy and some of these administrative functions? And so I struggle sometimes with, are we trying to figure out the future of how we want to deliver public safety well here? And is that colliding with some of the other reform efforts that we're making and the sort of evolution of the Vermont Criminal Justice Council? We passed two bills already uh, out of this committee about the Vermont Criminal Justice Council in support of their, their work in sort of evolving the training uh, and accountability efforts for law enforcement. So I don't want to duplicate those. So I hear that loud and clear. But I guess what I would ask is, would you recommend if we do anything like this, if we're tasking the department or the department in consultation with some of these individuals, if, you know, do you feel that there is a need for us to look at the structure of the office of sheriff and, and how it's administered throughout the state? Because what, every time we have a conversation about this bill, I, I think about things like the, what the sheriff's doing in one county and the neighboring county are completely different. And we've almost incentivized that with the structure we have. I mean, should we, is it the department's recommendation that, that we only focus really narrowly on, on considering policy for, you know, administrative functions and things like compensation benefits? I, I mean, or should we be looking at sort of, is this the right way to deliver these public safety functions in the long run? So I think at a threshold, that's then a conversation that really goes beyond the sheriff's departments, which include Department of Public Safety, the, the municipal departments, or you know, other a lot of other stakeholders that are contemplated here. And understanding that, you know, so I'll give my experience with Washington County. Washington County is, you know, one of the mid-sized counties in the state, and we are fortunate to have um, a number of municipal departments. So they really take over most of the day-to-day -day policing. Um, and the sheriff's department fills in so some traffic contracts, the transport of people to and from court, and some just general law enforcement assistance. So not saying whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, there isn't a huge role for the Washington County Sheriff's Department because the areas where we have dense population are covered by municipal departments and then state police cover other areas. It is a completely different story in other counties where your sheriff's department is effectively the only law enforcement entity there. So our most rural counties, Grand Isle, Essex, are almost completely reliant upon the sheriff's department. And then other communities in Wyndham County, where Sheriff Anderson is located, uh, some of those communities, in lieu of creating their own municipal departments, have elected to contract with the sheriff for law enforcement services. So one thing I think I, think I can say safe on that department is Flexibility within the statutes can have its drawbacks, but that flexibility is what enables the provision of these essential public safety services in, um, you know, in a manner that serves constituencies. And ultimately, you know, we can hope that voters make informed decisions, um, but certainly uh, a lot of the sheriff's races around the state this year were, in fact, contested. And that's a healthy sign that there are different or competing visions of how to deliver those services being presented to voters. And um, ultimately, there is the check where every four years, um, everyone has the choice to um, select new leadership if they so desire. I think from any review that the department would do in consultation with other groups would, would um, raise some, potentially raise some ideas. Um, uh, we know now that it talks about sheriffs with general law enforcement duties, with processing civil service, uh, civil process, uh, serving civil process. We know that they have some specific duties in, in the statute, transportation of prisoners and juveniles. And uh, so we know that there are some things. If there were, if, if in those in conversations, uh, the department with other groups where things are highlighted, I think we would put that out for people to consider. Um, that, but again, as Rory says, that it's very different in a, in Chittenden County than it is in, in uh, Grand Isle County, where that is, you know, um, Sheriff Allen is the law enforcement for that area. And if somebody's kicking your door in at two in the morning, you know, you're calling the sheriff's department because state police are 45 minutes away. Or more. Um, so I think we have to look at. I think it's a to your question, Mr. Chair. I think that um, all good ideas can come through the process. Um, and I think we would be uh, really working towards making sure that we are, we're, we don't have blinders on, that we're looking at and hearing from other people. 
um, as to what what they what they want to see, but some of it may already be there. You know, a lot of the stuff that Rory's pointed out this morning, are, you know, where he said it's already in 290 or it's in here, it's there. I think it's a matter of, of just making sure that we really do know what's already existed, where the big gaps are. Um, so I, it's just my thought about this. this I, I don't feel that the study committee is is necessary uh, in the in the way it's set up here. Um, do you have any testimony on other parts of the bill before I ask you a couple of questions about the 5%? Is... I was going to address the 5%. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Let's get it. laughs> before we wrap up. I keep looking at my phone now because I'm being I was reached out at one point um, before today to uh, my former finance commissioner over the Department of Labor. And I was, I think I've, I had testified to the committee about um, the state of Vermont when they are, um, uh, when they accept contracts or grants, you know, what do they do with the entities that they have, what do they charge? And I think it's a really, so if you look at the 5%, and I want to say what I'm about to say doesn't, doesn't um, in any way suggest that you shouldn't look at what they should, what a sheriff should be able to do with 5% or how much they should be able to avoid any so given that, but some people have said, why can they do that? So if you, if you, um, a sheriff does a contract for services and they commit, let's say, uh, to a local hospital, making this up, uh, to provide some security and they commit two staff people to do that. <clears throat> so in that contract that they're writing, they're, they're charging for that employee's time. They can charge for, uh, if it's full time, they can charge for the benefits, the salary, the benefits, use of the car if the car goes over um, a portion of the person's um, uh, liability insurance or things like that so the sheriff can write a contract that is recouping the cost but ultimately that contract and the performance of that contract is hopefully there's performance measures written into the contract for the sheriff um, ultimately the sheriff is responsible for ensuring that the contract is all the all the um, guarantees are met that it's staffed um, the sheriff owns, the, you know, the overall uh, negotiations with their general liability company, with the worker comp and all of that. The sheriff has a lot of stuff that goes into giving a body over to do some work. Similarly, in the state of Vermont, I was thinking about this. I know that when, when I was serving over at Labor <laughs> Commissioner, that my salary was charged to uh, most of the federal grants that were that were brought in, a portion of my salary, not all of it, and of the general counsels and of the director of that program, even though not, none of us, let's say the three of us, none of us did the work for that contract, but ultimately we were considered to be responsible for the performance and the staffing and all of the things that were required. So interestingly, when I was reached out and I asked about what, what do we, my question was, remind me, remind me how much we were charging into sort of that stuff. And I mentioned that this was in relationship to the 5% of the sheriff. And this is what came back to me from our finance director there. Most indirect rates are typically much higher than 5%. In fact, the federal government's de minimis indirect rate is 10%. And he quoted the language for me. VDAL's current indirect budgeting rate is 18% of salaries. Our most recently submitted proposal is asking for a budgeting rate of 23% of salaries. As an aside, when I worked at UVM, and this is, this is the person that's writing to me, it was common to have UVM have an indirect rate of 52% of the total award. So the quote here then talks about the de minimis rate of 10%. Now, what, is that, what does that provide? You know, why, can it, why can a state agency charge the federal government a de minimis rate of 10% or more? Basically, because what the theory is, is that the people who are in charge of that contract and ultimately responsible, part of their salary is that they should be spending some time on that, on that program and watching that program. That's what I did at labor. I mean, I, all of the grants that we were taking in, the Vermont Department of Labor is 92% federally funded. Most of our money is coming from a bunch of different federal grants. But ultimately, it was my responsibility every week to be watching how the performance of those grants was going. Did we have people doing what they said they were going to do? So we were being paid by the federal government to do some work. 
So in essence, the 5% of, you know, ultimately, how does 5% come into these contracts? It's similarly the same thing. So in essence, that sheriff's time um, is, this is a portion of that sheriff's time. Now, again, I want to say very clearly that I completely support the committee's review of, or consideration of saying what can be done with that 5%. Clearly, you want that money to be used Prefer, you know, most preferably for the benefit of the citizens and the department. Um, in this, where, for example, the one thing I, I, I have some concerns about where it talks about it cannot be used um, for retirement contributions or employment benefits. The one thing that I think was lost on the situation with the Caledonia Sheriff, and I want to I want to basically stick up for um, for what Sheriff Shatney did in some regard is that some of the money that he was awarding, he was never able, he never felt that he was able to, and I think it's probably true because he was a smaller department. He was never able to uh, fiscally fund um, retirement and health insurance for his employees. Some of the other larger departments do, they, they pay into Beamers or they have, they have a separate health insurance. He never did that. So part of those, that, those bonuses he gave was in essence, I, don't, I can't give you health insurance and retirement, but I'm giving you some money that you can pay your health insurance premium and you can put some money into a 401k if you so choose. It, had he not done that, you know, those employees would have, you know, they'd have to be taking that out of their own salary with no employee and no employer support. And so at least to the extent that I know that that was part of what, what Sheriff Shatton did, once or twice a year was to help them with, with some, and again, I don't want to talk, you know, not necessarily the larger bonuses of salary, because I think that has to be contained. I really do. But that piece of it, I think, was actually appropriate to say, I can't pay your, I can't give you health insurance. I can't give you retirement because I can't afford it as a department. But I'm going to give you some money, and if you choose to do that. So this language basically would preclude, as written, would preclude some of that. So put some, definitely put some, some as we keep calling the guardrails, I call them bumpers around how they can spend that money. No question that has to be done. No question. But, but not necessarily don't throw the baby out with the bathwater because there was some good intent in some of what was being done. So Amy, it sounded like even in the auditor's re response or recommendations in the light of that revelation of those, you know, on the surface, the eye popping $400,000 of bonuses what, with this, that, um, the, the sheriff wasn't doing anything that was illegal or against even a policy because there isn't really, there aren't bumpers, there aren't guardrails, there isn't a model policy that says this is the appropriate way to do this, this is how you document it in a way that I think would give us all the sense that there was, you know, some rationale that, uh, other than just this is what this particular sheriff thinks at this moment is the right thing to do. And, um, I'm wondering if you kind of agree with the auditor's perspective that it's on us to, to sort of move into a space where there's a more consistent policy adoption. Yeah. Um, yes, yes, absolutely. And I think that's one area where, where the Sheriff's um, Association of the Department would work very quickly um, to get a policy in place so that the sheriffs know what they should or should not be doing around this money. The other thing I, you know, I, that has come up is the issue of compensation for the sheriff, him or herself. And the question is, you've heard, I think, Sheriff Anderson and perhaps Sheriff Marcoux both testify, like their salary level versus their counterparts in the state police. And I went out and I did some research and tried to look at what would it look like if they were being paid at the same level as a senior, you know, a, um, a lieutenant or a major what, or a captain. What would it look like with similar years of service? You know, you can build a pay grid that, so there's, there's salary statutorily set, just like a state's attorneys. So if the question is, in, ad, in addition to their, their statutory salary, what would they be allowed to take? It may be one of those things where you say, okay, this is the grid. You have 22 years of law enforcement experience. And in that, we're gonna compare you to pick, pick one, a captain. You know, so you can take, go off the grid, you can take, if you, if you earn that money, you can supplement yourself with X. And you might even wanna say up to a cap of X. But there's, there are ways to develop compensation plans for the sheriffs that, that will not have people being upset or concerned about, about the sheriff's 
overly enriching themselves. Questions for Rory or Amy before we wrap up this conversation for today? President Hoover. It still is very murky to me. It's like at one point earlier said that the sheriff draws part of the 5% as an administrative fee for monitoring the contracts. That kind of equates to salary. Or does it kind of equate to if it's the sheriff's contract and it's outside the state business, then is the sheriff running a business where he's compensated? And if that is compensation, then why isn't any of our business? So it, there's that's no, not been that, that, that's that, not been delineated. That is that is exactly dead on point because you the, this construct of a sheriff's department is is not found anywhere else in state government. You basically have a statutorily established uh, departments that are these public private entities, and it, it's it, you know to. You know, is there, you know, how did the conflict exist? Well, it was set up by statute. You're asking people to chase, you know, the, the private money through the contracts, yet there's, you know, but we view them as state. We look at them as public officials, which they are, and state people are right. I think Representative Cooper's correct. I, I, I'll point out that, for example, uh, the state transport program, of which the, the state transport deputies are part of our department, that five percent that the sheriff takes in is buying the helping to buy the cars. The state of Vermont does not provide the cars, uniforms, the guns, or send or send people to the academy to do those jobs. That five percent is helping to pay for that. So it's really it, it is exactly as you're saying. Is the sheriff responsible for if it's not used for the business, quote unquote? Is the sheriff responsible for paying income tax on? It? If there's if any money you take as compensation as an employee, you have to pay income tax on it. So, do we know if that happens? I mean, I, that sort of is a tipping point if you're paying income tax. I don't know if the IRS is listening well, to my check, but I don't know. I, I think what are you getting at, Representative Cooper? The the, the money that it, that is uh, billed through a contract to cover overhead expenses doesn't go directly to the sheriff as an individual. It comes into the sheriff's office, and then under the current construct, they have the ability to use those funds to compensate staff, to pay for a car, to buy insurance, and and also compensate themselves. But they only would get charged income tax when they sort of pay themselves those funds. It's not as if they, they're not like a the sheriff's office isn't a corporation that pays well, income tax. If the sheriff builds a contract and includes overhead and compensation in the contract, knowing that there's 5% that is over and above all the contract provisions that goes to the sheriff, then that sort of, I mean, it's just very murky. You can argue, I think, weird stuff based on what we've heard so far. I guess, I guess maybe what I would ask is right now, um, short of the audits, is there anything that um, sort of exposes what any of the funds that come into a sheriff's office really get used for? I mean, the, the uh, auditor's audits should be able to show you that. And, and the question that Representative Cooper just asked, it may be better addressed to Sheriff Anderson and Mark Koo in terms of talking about that. So. I don't want to go get out of my skis because it's sort of, I look at it as, I look at it as, as the analogy in state government, what we've done over the years, and nobody's, you know, nobody's you know, had a heart attack about that. But um, uh, I think that's a better question to address to them. Can I address one other issue? Yeah, sure. So the other thing is that I know in, in this, you're looking at um, establishing court security through the sheriffs. And... Um, I said before, I'm concerned that if it's left specifically just to per diem staff, um, you're not going to have the you're not going to have the consistency and the coverage that you really need. Um, 
the I think it's I think incorporating those positions uh, as state employees gives you the uh, the consistency the court is saying the court testified that they can't op open they can't operate if they don't feel that they can operate without security I think that's true um, doing that is doing that as per diems is going to be really difficult to ensure consistency we do not have turn turnover in, in our positions our state transport deputies until they retire they are with us they are we've got a really long tenured group of employees they're very skilled um, and they don't they don't leave those positions I think establishing these as more secure positions with, with benefits and would be would be a better idea wherever they land whether they go to the judiciary or wherever um, I still think that that looking at them as per diems is not necessarily going to achieve what the court wants. And the other thing is a conversation should be had with the, had with the sheriffs and not me as to whether or not, I know the court has said that they, that they need to be level three certified. I'm not sure the sheriffs fully agree with that statement. And I think getting people, getting people, finding level three certified people right now is really difficult. You're hearing it from every agency, every law enforcement agency. I think that um, have a conversation, continued conversation with the sheriffs. If, is that is that really necessary or not? Well, you've given us a lot to think about. Mm -hmm. uh, we will probably end up having you back as we consider uh, taking up amendments over the next few days. Uh, really appreciate both of you being here with us. Um, we're going to break now for lunch. Um, and committee will be back after the floor. Um, we have uh, testimony scheduled at three, and then I'd like to have a little bit of time for committee discussion about some of the things that we've heard in testimony so far on the bill that will help feed into what we can ask Mr. Devlin to do in a draft of um, updated language to see. So we'll adjourn and go off live for now. Thank you all very much. Thank you.